Great, thank you. So, yes, uh, it's me. Um, I spent a lot of time working on a lot of digital things uh, for many years and uh, read Paper Heart when we founded that with uh, friends. We're basically always looking for ways to take the digital skills that we know and apply them to physical spaces. We came from a digital world and now there's new exciting ways to, uh, to use those skills. Um, I think that probably the best way to describe what we do is, is maybe just to show this um, quick uh, clip here. So we're part of the experiential design industry. That's a term that, that kind of popped up just recently, that um, there's some consensus that a lot of different people out there doing uh, different things are, are part of this umbrella of experiential design. And there's a lot of expectations around experiential that, um, that, uh, that we're working on the future of technology, but it wasn't always uh, that's not exactly why we do what we do. Um, often, we're not looking into the future, we're looking uh, into the past, but uh, it's, it's an expectation that's out there. Um, but I think there's a lot of inspiration to be had by uh, investigating lost experiences from the past. Um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of kind of historical references today uh, with arcades. So I kind of want to like show uh, a little bit why I want to talk about the past first. Um, I'll get to arcades in a, in a second, but um, sometimes people will say like, what, you know, what, what technology are you, are you into right now? And they, they want you to say like the Leap or VR or something. But, um, you know, recently I, I was like, I'm, I'm into stained glass. Um, <laughs> I think that's really cool technology, basically like playing with light and um, color. And it's amazing that this thousand-year-old form of painting is um, still prevalent today. Um, we, were, um, we saw a really cool stained glass recently, and we were talking about, like, what, what if this were interactive? What if people could actually... Uh, you know, change stained glass by standing in front of it. Um, so we started, uh, often we'll make sort of like mood imagery of, of an idea like this. Um, like what would the experience be like? Could you take something like this out of the um, churches and create a brand new experience that maybe people have forgotten, um, but you make it new again with interactivity? Um, so we like we also built uh, something quick in our office with transparent screens. I don't know if you guys have seen um, transparent screens. They use them in storefronts now. Like you can put products behind them and, and stuff. And but uh, but we actually wanted to use it for for kind of like an art piece. Um, so we set this up in the office.
So yeah, everything in that video, the light source was the sun. So we're basically like animating sunlight. But the reason why I'm showing this is because I really think that uh, taking things that from the past that people have forgotten and using technology to uh, change them and augment them can be a way of coming up with like new experiences. Um, and the same can be applied to the arcade. And it, that's something that we actually look back all the time on. The arcades are interesting because I grew up with really cool uh, arcades, but nowadays the, um, there's a lot of sort of, the, the arcade has gotten kind of generalized. Like, you know, people would call like a collection of games on an iPad an arcade, uh, but that's not really what I would describe uh, as an arcade. Um, there's Dave and Buster's. People are like, oh, there's, you know, arcades aren't dead. They're, you know, you can, there's Dave and Buster's. I don't know if they have that here, but it's basically, um, it's basically a bar, and it has, ar you know, arcade games in it. But yeah, if you're getting tickets, <laughs> drinking beer, your stock photo model, you're, it's not an arcade. Like that's that's a bar, and the tickets are sort of like gambling. Um, and then there's this. <laughs> this is actually I found when I, I, I googled sad arcade. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of cool things that we can learn from, from uh, kind of like old school arcades. And um, I'm going to get to the future arcades later, but uh, when sort of building this talk, I found like so many cool things that I just kind of want to spend a little more time on the, on the past than the future. Um, but it's also like, it's kind of how we make work. It's like we, we come, we find these cool things that maybe might be useful as inspiration and they could be useful for you guys as well. Uh, so... In the 70s, like, that was, like, the height, uh, one of the peaks of arcades. It was just, like, a really cool place um, where people witnessed the future. Um, they saw innovations being delivered at a frightening pace. Um, it was, like, every time you went to an arcade, you saw, you saw into the future. And because of that, there was so much excitement, they actually designed the arcades, like, spaceships and... Um, there was a lot of care into presenting this um, as like this fun, new, exciting things. It's pretty amazing that during this time of excitement, it could even, um, it, you, you got games like this with basically, instead of a regular monitor, it's using vector-based technology, where, which was invented with the oscilloscope. It's an electron beam that's actually drawing all of the art uh, that you see. And if you see this game, uh, Asteroids, the original cabinet in person, it's, it's impossible to show it here as a video, but the glow of it almost blinds you, and it's, it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful games um, I've ever seen. It was also like a sexy place, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that at one point they, they thought that maybe they could make arcades sexy. Um, but like everybody went to arcades, like you'd go and, you know, like maybe your dad's love was dependent on how well you did at games. But most importantly, we used to have like this public place where everybody could go and see the latest of what's happening. Um, it's not something that we have now, where like freely available at, at uh, malls and centers of towns, that you'd be able to walk in and just see um, the cutting edge of, of what was happening. Now, one of the cool things about uh, old school arcades is because people had the power um, through, um, through coins, like basically you chuck quarters in. And now, 
at home, you have to, you have to buy an expensive uh, piece of equipment to play games, but we had this great forum where you could try out something just for a quarter, uh, see what a game was like, or see what an experience was like with, with a very small amount of money. Uh, and it was open to anyone. And based on the games getting the, the quarters, you would see like what games were good and what games were not. And there was an, also an economy there, like a quarter from the 1970s uh, is worth like $1.50 now. So if you think about people checking in quarters every uh, minute or so, that's, that's a fair amount of money compared to building an iPhone game now. Uh, people are typically spending like a dollar to download your game, but imagine somebody checking in $1.50 every couple of minutes. And that kind of economy supported a lot of a lot of creations. So a lot of the innovations that I'm going to show are based on that economy. Plus, it's like a really cool sound. When you, when you put a quarter into an arcade, that, I have like a Pavlovian response to that sound. I just know that something cool is going to happen. And we were talking about like what, what was the first coin op? Um, and uh, like, or how old was that, that first coin-operated thing. And it turns out that, uh, that it came from vending machines. Vending machines were first. Um, how old would you think that the oldest vending machine is? Like 100 years, 200 years? Any, any guesses? Yeah, that's exactly right. Internet. <laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised by that. Um, that you know, like most people attribute it to this uh, stamp machine in the eight, uh, late 1800s, but um, but there was an inventor in ancient Greece that um, made a dispenser of holy water. I guess there was a there was a problem where people were taking too much holy, holy water. So they had to control it, and he made this invention that would just, the weight of the coin would uh, tip a lever that would release um, a valve, and out, out would come the water. Very simple mechanism, but the actual uh, weight uh, lever system is, is loosely what we have now, um, but, uh, but in ancient Greece. Now, there were a lot of innovations between then and modern times, so 2,000 years of human innovation, we get the donkey wonder. Sorry, I just found this uh, online. It's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> but there was like a lot of weird stuff that people would make, and I actually, I just love that. I let, you know, there's a whole history of vending machines that were use, useful for dispensing um, gum and uh, you know stamps and, and all, that, all that kind of stuff. But I love that at one point they changed from something where you would pay money for something useful to something totally intangible like entertainment uh, where you'd get your f fortune or a lot of them were actually you would chuck in a, a coin and just watch something play out like uh, a guy would, a goofy guy would just run or uh, something would animate and I just love that that the idea of like paying for like small amounts of entertainment. So we actually built uh, something in the office, uh, which is just, it's like a coin activated mural. So people could kind of like create and change art based on uh, coins. And we posted this online and somebody was like, yeah, this is a great way for uh, people to pay for installations. You could just have like coin slots on things. Um, it kind of like, it imagines a world maybe where uh, people could give you money for your, for your stuff, for your, for your cool art. Um, one of the other source points for um, arcades is the, the carnival. There's the carnival midway where you do like skill games. Like, um, this is a really scary carnival. <laughs> um, 
but like there weren't arcades, so you, if you wanted to have a variety of experiences in one, one place, you would go to a carnival and they would, they, they would travel through. And uh, The Strongman is one of my favorite games at, um, at a carnival. I'm not very good at it, but it, it's just cool. Uh, we actually built something. Uh, this was at FITC a few years ago. This is basically like you can run and jump on this giant bear, and based on your imp uh, impact, it it creates a certain level of faces. So like this was like a pretty good impact right here. Um, but yeah, like we we take things like this from the from the past and like figure out new ways to combine them with technology. Um, ski ball. I'm a huge fan of ski ball. I was surprised to find out that um, the original ski ball was 36 feet long. It was uh, made by uh, this guy who uh, his dad was owned a lumber company, so he had access to a lot of uh, like so he could make a 36 foot long wood contraption, um, and you would roll a steel ball down like this 30 foot ramp. And, uh, and then it would launch into the, the circles that we're familiar now with ski ball. Uh, but yeah, he made it for his son's birthday party. And I sort of imagine that these nets were like invented later, like, <laughs> like after that birthday party, <laughs> something horrible happened. Um, I also like that, um, the description that it gives much pleasure, moderate exercise, and becomes very fascinating. <laughs> I'm going to put that in a proposal at some point, like <laughs> that this project is going to become fascinating later. Like maybe it's not that interesting now, but it'll get there. <laughs> um, I was searching for like the biggest uh, ski ball thing that anybody had made uh, online, and the biggest thing I could find was at Burning Man. Uh, the uh, fire ski ball, um, which is super cool, um, but uh, but it is still not even nearly as long as the original. And I kind of I kind of want to see how badass the original was. Um, we're always like thinking about well, you know, ski ball games and stuff like that. So we we have a host of prototypes where uh, nothing has turned into a full on ski ball experience yet, but. Um, but it's something that we, we talk about a lot. Uh, another interesting thing about ski ball is that it, in many ways, sort of foretold the arcade because it was shrunk down from this huge thing to something manageable to, uh, so that it could move indoors and then uh, fit a lot of these experiences so that people could come to a physical location and um, play this entertainment. Um, another big part is just like the idea of skill elements. That it wasn't actually originally uh, arcades didn't actually have uh, skill elements. The original pinball didn't have flippers. It was just a plunger. You would pull back, and the ball would just bounce around these pins. Um, hence, the, you know, pinball. Um, even though people like the first thing people picture with pinball is like the flipper, but uh, that didn't come till later. There's actually a really cool um, podcast. I don't know if do you guys listen to 99% uh, Invisible at all. You should check it out. Um, they did a thing about the history of pinball, and um, the interesting thing is that uh, it like because there was no skill element, people would just bet. They'd bet money on the outcome. So you just watch this ball play out and bet money on what was going to happen. And consequently, it got wrapped up in gambling and maybe the mob was sort of involved. And the mayor of New York, this is Mayor LaGuardia, smashing pinballs with, uh, with a sledgehammer. Uh, these were like, he'd have like these public... Uh, news conferences where he would just like wreck pinball. Uh, and at one point, he said that his top priority was getting rid of pinball. If you, if you can imagine a time where a New York mayor made it his top priority to get rid of pinball, 
It's incredible. There's, mo there's more on the podcast about this particular part of history. Uh, but the reason I mention it is that this gave rise to the skill element of pinball. Uh, so they introduced the flipper so that it would be a game of skill and not a game of gambling. And there's a resurgence right now. Uh, Wired Magazine wrote an article about it where these tournaments of pinball tournaments are popping up everywhere in the country. And it's because of this skill element and, and that feeling and the physics, the real physics of a ball rolling around and your control of, over the experience is still in many ways unmatched by digital experiences because of the amount of control that a, a true master can exert on this. Um, but things like this, like the fact that the pinball machine evolved from uh, evolved in form and introduced things like the flippers, like these innovations don't stop in arcades. They just come one after another. The, arc, uh, the pinball machine evolved as well. There's like this weird thing that I, th I think people like aren't, aren't aware of, like in between video games and pinball machines, people act like there were pinball machines and then boom, out of nowhere, uh, video games just dropped. Uh, but there's this weird midpoint where people are making these like hacks of uh, pinball uh, machines like late 60s, early 70s. Um, this was like a motorcycle game and it combined all the animation that you see in these are, is totally analog. Uh, there'd be like rotating discs, like just like really amazing stuff. Like they'd have like a 3D <laughs> video there. This sort of looks like a video game, but it's not. It's all motors. There's like a motor drive. It, it's like rotating these transparent discs, and all the art is on that disc. And then it's just shining a light and mirrors back up to the, the cabinet top. And it must have been so amazingly hard to make these. I just love that these exist. Uh, they were always inventing different ways to combine uh, projection and physical inter interactivity. This one's hard to see. It's a shark coming at you. And even uh, simple things like um, a submarine moving back and forth or clouds, like all, to make those effects, you had to like rotate a giant disc and, and shoot light through it. And everything was, uh, you know, like hacked together like this. These were the, the ships going back and forth. Like really, really clever stuff. And we draw from this all the time. We, we take ideas uh, from these things so much. Uh, we made this project with uh, bikes with, um, actually it was pretty loosely inspired by that first motorcycle thing. Um, just that idea of like real physical objects and uh, environments passing by and the environments being kind of like, um, like a loop when we designed all the graphics. We designed them all as if they were just simply rotating drums. There's also just future stuff we saw in arcades uh, growing up. There was this, uh, you would walk into an arcade and suddenly a new thing would be available. This was called like the R360. It allowed people to basically just fly in any direction. This one actually cost a dollar, so it was worth it. Um, people think that like somehow like Coachella invented holograms, but in the 90s, you could play holograms in an arcade. Uh, there was this awesome thing called the Time Traveler, and it was all playable, interactive, holographic video, uh, which was... Uh, people would just line up for this game. I actually never even played this. There were so many people huddled around it that you just watch somebody else play it. Um, yeah, like VR <clears throat> is super cool right now. 90s, arcades. 
could walk in and, and uh, people were always experimenting with these immersive technologies even back then. They're of course much better now, but, uh, but they've been thinking about it for, for this long. This is also arcade of the 90s. Immersive technologies. Like, if you had to go by an arcade and not go in, like if, uh, if you weren't allowed to, like your mom was too busy, it was, it was torture. It was torture, because you would be missing uh, something new that people were going to be talking about. And there was no other way to access these things, so you had to like, go to the arcade, uh, which, which made the arcades super exciting. In some ways, sometimes it felt like magic. Like, this is a typical um, game in like 1983. Very small sprites, very large pixels. And out of nowhere, uh, somebody released this game that seemed like, like the future had just landed, uh, where this is a typical game screen from 1983, and you step up and uh, you saw something like this. These are actual uh, game screens where somebody would actually be playing what uh, this fluid animation and big characters. And it seemed impossible because in many ways it was a trick, but it gave us a glimpse into the future of like what, what uh, games could be. Like you could play fully animated movies. It's called Dragon Slayer. And the trick was that it was just a laser disc that was playing different aspects of video. So the laser disc would jump around to different uh, parts of the video based on what you were doing in the cabinet. And the controls were really simple. They were like, you had to quick jump left at a certain moment or quick uh, hit the sword button, and then it would play the sword sequence. So it was a total magic trick in which that there was a reason why they were able to achieve uh, amazing animation at, at that time. Uh, but because it was the first uh, time somebody had tried this, you didn't know that it was just skipping around video. You had, you had no concept that, that something like that could exist. And so for the people that saw this for the first time, it just seemed like, uh, like you were actually playing a movie. Also, like the act of playing games around other people, where it's not something you're just playing at home, but you're playing it around uh, strangers and friends. Then it became, there was a whole host of activity around just watching people playing video games. So you would play, other people would cheer you on, or, uh, you know, or vice versa. And there are many reasons for why the arcades uh, fell out of favor. Um, I'm not going to go into the forces at work because they're fairly complicated. Um, but more importantly, we've sort of lost something by, by not having arcades. And this, what we've lost is this public meeting place. Uh, and now most of these machines are either abandoned or not working or in storage. Uh, the people that buy them are usually for private collections. But creativity has always saved the arcade. In the past, when uh, the arcade was threatened, it, it was really the creators that came up with new ways to, uh, to entertain people. So I think we can take these various things that were cool about old arcades to create something new. And as an industry, uh, in experiential design, this is a lot of what we do anyway. Like we, we take things from inspired from arcades. This one was uh, this sort of like loosely based on like a Chuck E. Cheese um, ball pit. Uh, people could jump in and 
uh, create graphics. And it's like these moments that, uh, that we can create. We're inspired by the, the tactile nature of like old pinball machines. Uh, like the, the fact that like to show a score, you would actually need to see the numbers. Uh, you, you would actually see the numbers uh, click by. But most of the time, as an experienced designer, you're doing one experience. You're doing an installation for, for a company or, a, or event, and uh, there's a large amount of work involved in it, and you do one singular experience. Uh, but we explored, like, well, what happened if we collected a bunch of the things that we've made together? So we had a, we had a party in our office once. We just took all of our old projects and shoved them in our studio, uh, kind of like called it an arcade. And so we, we got the bike project going. There's the, uh, the bear there and the, um, the ball pit uh, we installed in our bathtub. Uh, and we, we made like a top score list and stuff. And so in, this is kind of like an arcade, like there's different experiences people can go around. Um, and interact with, but it's still missing something. And it's missing that element of maybe, maybe we don't have to create the entire arcade ourselves because different arcade machines were made by different people. So maybe it doesn't make sense for us to make the entire arcade. You used to be able to see a wide variety of experiences made by different teams. And that's really what, what made it lively. Uh, some of this is happening. Uh, you know, VR is certainly an interesting technology. I, th I think more so than the super immersion steam coming at you, fans and stuff being suspended. More so than that, like what's exciting about VR is that it's actually a fairly affordable and portable technology. So what you're seeing now is a lot of art shows that are starting to collect things that uh, individual creators have made and wrapping it into a show. And that way, in the same way as like an old arcade, you could go around to different uh, stations and see and experience uh, what different people have made. And I think that's, that's tremendously exciting. And we need more of these things. We need more people creating uh, these experiences that can be collected together uh, to form what could be the future of arcades. Uh, there's these two really cool guys that um, they had a history of making online arcade games. And they thought they were missing something, too, by just making things that were online. And they missed that atmosphere of like an old arcade where people would be yelling over your shoulder. And they created this five-on-five five versus game called Killer Queen. So team, two teams of five battle it out against each other to get a snail across the screen. But like this simple thing that, that might be mildly entertaining online was huge in person because people have really been looking for this kind of experience. Like people don't even know that they missed it. Uh, but suddenly they were getting this huge response from crowds. <laughs> this is a guy that like ripped his shirt off while he was playing because <laughs> it gets really intense. Uh, but I love that there's people out there making this stuff. Like I want to make an old arcade game. I um, I love that there's people out there doing that. So we want in on it too, of course. We want to make stuff. Uh, I guess my my master's thesis. Uh, for this is that let's build arcade games and meet up at an art gallery to play them in real life. And it'll be super cool. <laughs> super serious goal. Uh, we, we actually got uh, an old pinball machine in the, in the office. Um, we ripped it open, uh, attached sensors to all of the bumpers and lights basically tried to measure everything that was physically happening on a pinball machine so that we could use it to create art. Um, there's like, uh, there's a lot going on. We took, we took a video of the 
of the actual process. The um, score, we, we, we were working out how to measure the, the score, because that could be useful in creating art as well. And we ended up just using OCR uh, camera tech to actually look at the actual physical score and then record it digitally. And part of the goal of doing something like this uh, is so that others can do the same thing that we've done. Because these kinds of things are more fun with other people. So this pinball project that we're working on now, which we haven't finished, um, is meant for other people to, to join in. Every time somebody comes to the office, we usually like show them the pinball machine in various states of completion. And uh, our friends um, at Truth Labs, actually, we had them over. And they went back and uh, were able to build their own uh, fairly easily using the same techniques that we did. Attaching sensors to the, to the bumpers and lights is pretty straightforward. And um, measuring the score, and they were able to turn it into like a really cool experience. So now we're working on a kit that allows other people to uh, do the same things that, uh, that we've done. Something where you could get a pinball machine, hook up all the sensors, and use, use the data coming off of it to, uh, to work on your own projects. So each, each uh, pinball machine takes the, uh, the ideas that you use the, the pinball art from the actual machine to inspire your art, because uh, each piece will, will be like its own art piece that honors the original machine. And we're working on collecting this into an art show so that people could walk around and see artwork built by different teams powered by pinball. It's like a group art show meets a pinball gallery uh, all in one. So people can just like come if they're interested in pinball, just like play some games, but if they're interested in the artists, uh, they can come and see the art. It's kind of like a, like a cool hybrid. I sort of imagine a future arcades where we have like these public forums where different creators can bring their creations together to create, uh, to create arcades. And this, this environment uh, can be like somewhat collaborative, somewhat competitive, uh, but all towards creating different works as part of a larger experience. Often, like, as creators, we, we, do, we work on our own stuff, right? Like, different teams, they, they want to be the first to do uh, this thing or the first to innovate uh, something over here. Uh, but there's actually a real uh, cool thing that happens when, uh, when you have something that's more collaborative. But that's why we're here at places like FITC, where we can share what we're working on now uh, and see if, if there's other people that want to uh, join in with what we're doing. Um, and even if it's not with us, it's, it's, it's about all these creators here getting together and finding ways to exhibit their creations together. Thanks. Thank <clears throat> you.